<clears throat> I'm Bob Norton, and you know we'll give people a few more minutes to join. If you want to introduce yourself, uh, please do. There are uh, going to be quite a few people here today. Let's get started. We've given people uh, four minutes to join, and I'm going to uh, start going through the, the slides and close the chat box. If you have questions, uh, put them in there. Um, Lulu, would you mute everyone now so that we can uh, get started? Um, we're going to do a, a quick poll. So uh, we've got a few polls to keep this interactive. And I'm going to launch the first poll now, which is. Um, so we'll give you 30 seconds to click on one of those uh, four. Looks like it's an, it coming up in real time, and we'll we'll publish those results right now. This forty three percent of you are trying to raise capital immediately, which is the most common situation. But people often underestimate the time it will take. Um, Ten percent are beginning the process um, within six months. Um, more than a year is five percent, and then people who are just you know ahead of the curve, and that's a good thing. Forty-five percent of you are are just preparing. So um, I'll give you ten more seconds to click on one of those four answers. Um, but it looks like the the percentage is stabilized: forty-two percent immediately, thirteen percent um, beginning within six months, and forty-two percent an equal amount. That are just preparing and uh, learning now. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to share the results of that real quickly, and you can you can see the results. We've got uh, I guess we had about 30, 30, you know, maybe almost thirty people that uh, that answered that. Some of you, I guess, are too shy, uh, but that's okay. We're not we're not collecting this data or doing anything with it. It's just a little uh, uh, interactive thing to add. So let's get started. Um, you know, I'm Bob Norton, a serial entrepreneur. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my background here because most of you probably have been following me and know this, but there's a slide here with some of my accomplishments. I, I've got a lot of miles on my chassis, as I, as I like to say, and could spend an hour talking, but I hate webinars where people spend an hour talking or 20 minutes talking about themselves. Suffice it to say, I've been a, a serial entrepreneur uh, founding my first company as CEO uh, in 1989. And I've spent the last, uh, oh, I guess since 2002, doing a lot of consulting and advising and sitting on boards uh, and helping others uh, to scale their businesses. Um, Airtight Management is really an expert at product launches and scaling. And we also uh, have the brand, the CEO Bootcamp, which is really the, the official sponsor of this as a sample of the, the kind of training that we do. Uh, we have about 40 courses now in our, our library and 360 different videos because they're all broken up into bite-sized pieces. And we also have the brand Airtight Management, which is the six systems for scaling. So let's dive into uh, financing. Um, Lulu is our, our administrator and our webmaster and chief cook and bottle washer, as my, my dad used to say. For uh, what it's worth, Bob, I don't hear any beeping. Financial, financial life cycle, um, you know, here's the big picture, and, and probably most of you know this, that, you know, from the idea stage with friends and family money and founder money, working through angel investment and venture capital is, is kind of the, the typical life cycle. And in the old days, everyone wanted to go public. Um, you'll see a slide that shows how that's declined rapidly in uh, the last decade. And a public exit is now much less common, um, but there are other exits and, uh, and, and good valuations to be had in other ways. Um, of course, there are at least 30 and maybe 40 different major sources of capital that are available along the life cycle. But uh, figuring out which one is right for you and targeting those 
uh, best investors that you can uh, interest and close easily is obviously the challenge. I list a few other here. Private equity tends to be moving down the scale and doing smaller deals now. They used to do, you know, only sort of mature companies with, you know, millions in EBITDA already and and you know twenty and thirty million dollars in revenue. But they're they're going after smaller companies. F uh, family offices now are getting into the earlier stage business and investments as well. Uh, obviously, secondary offerings, a lot of people are doing uh, direct offerings where they don't wind up paying investment bankers 10% of the, the fees to distribute the stock uh, by issuing more stock directly. And of course, a lot of the platforms are facilitating that. So any company can raise millions, and, and and you know this isn't hyperbole or marketing hype, um, because a company is just a legal entity that you put products and services into, right? And so it's all about developing a product roadmap that has the opportunity to go after a large enough market to be interesting um, to investors. Um, and typically, if you're if you're going after a large amount of capital, you know you've got to have the opportunity to get to a hundred million dollar company, and the space, um, you know, needs to be a, a you know half a billion or a billion dollars um, five years out anyway. Of course, if you're in a brand new space that you're creating, um, you know you're you're depending on projections of that space and the opportunity. But that size opportunity is what um, attracts investors. And I've had conversations with CEOs that say they can't envision their company getting that big. And my answer to that is, you know, that's sort of your job. If you want to attract capital, you've got to scale your thinking and your opportunity to get to a size because of 100 million or so. Um, that's the only way you're going to attract serious capital. Um, so it's very important to, to think about the product roadmap and the future. And obviously that can be by starting in a niche and adding, building a portfolio of niches. It can be by adding a portfolio of products over time. There's lots of ways to get to that $100 million. But you want to show that vision of what the company can be in the long term if you're going to uh, attract serious capital. So here's one of the simplest and, and uh, diagrams that I like the most about the life cycle because it's, it's very simple and shows the, the path or the life cycle from idea to revenue here across the, uh, the x-axis. Typically, friends and family and bootstrapping, you know, you're going to raise somewhere in the area of 25000 to 500000 um, I recommend strong bootstrapping for every company. It's really the only way that the founders are going to maintain some level of control early on, because if you didn't bootstrap your valuation early on is going to be low, then you're going to lose control. And, and the founding team is going to get diluted pretty quickly. So I personally would much rather take my time and bootstrap and stay in stealth mode for a year or two rather than go out and, and raise big funds. Obviously, there are situations where you may need to raise more funds earlier so that you can uh, grab a market share if there's competitors in the market space. But I believe in what we teach at the CEO Bootcamp is that every new product and every startup should have zero competition on day one by playing with the, uh, the many variables that would come up in a competitive landscape map um, so that you're, you're, you're unique in your niche and you're completely differentiated and going after some white space. Um, angels typically fund between half of a million and two million. Typically, you'll need a syndicate of angels or, or to tap into some platforms or networks to get to the $2 million area. We'll talk about some of the statistics of the average angel investment uh, in a bit. And then, of course, venture companies, they typically want to put at least five or $10 million to work because their funds are, are, are big enough that if they have a lot of small investments, they can't do the same amount of due diligence and assistance and sit on boards. So typically, even though they might invest, you know, a million or two or five in a first round, 
um, they, they would like to be able to put five or 10 million to work. And some of them, the bigger funds obviously will have bigger needs to put capital to work. And so they won't be interested in you uh, unless they can invest, you know, some of them 10, 20 million. I'm sure there are some that, you know, are up to uh, 50 million is sort of a minimum that they want to put to work because they're a billion dollar fund. And all of these funds, you know, have a limited life cycle and a, a limited number of investments they can make. Um, so myth number one, one of the things I want to do today is really bust a lot of the myths that the press propagates, but um, put create a mindset that is wrong for raising money because the, the press doesn't understand being a serial entrepreneur or, or scaling a company or any of these things. Um, the press is kind of notorious for misprinting and representing. And of course, they're trying to create headlines and, and sell papers and clickbaits and all that other stuff. But raising money is not easy. And in, in fact, you know, one in 400 plans are actually funded by venture capital uh, companies that look at those plans. And the percentage of uh, people receiving venture capital is quite small. Um, many other capital sources, oh, here we go. Um, the, the sources are surprising to most people. If you look at these relative bubbles, the size of the bubble is the annual investment that's made. And you'll see that VC investments um, that are only, this, this was, it's sort of old data, but, uh, and, and it's getting bigger, but relatively it's, it's probably the same. There's 50 billion, 59 billion in VC investments, um, you know, and, and almost as much angel investments. Now, I don't trust this data because not all angel investments are public information. Uh, and of course, what's not on this is all of the private banking transactions of loans, factoring, and you know the 20 other types of financing that semi-established businesses have. Uh, and of course, you know, I, uh, you know, I got, got to call attention to grants and awards because it's over 10 times as big as VC investments. So if you're in a segment where the government wants to encourage that, you know, Elon Musk got a lot of funding because of the green nature of, of Tesla, um, you know, and, and uh, sponsorship of the cars of thousands of dollars, et cetera. Um, so that, that category is not something to ignore if you're doing something the government has an interest in, and that might be because it's a minority owned business um, or in a certain area, there are development zones where money is dedicated to certain physical areas to, to uh, start businesses and launch products. Uh, obviously, I'm sure all of you know about the, the care package and the PPP loans that are now gone, but were very helpful during the, uh, the coronavirus. But most mistakenly think VC funding is the largest, and, and it's far from true. As a matter of fact, you'll see in this graph that 83% um, of new businesses that are hiring in, in this particular survey, and you know, all of these are slanted a little bit towards um, some set of people, but 83% are really not accessing any institutional capital. And I think that's greatly understated for the same reason I said before in that public information isn't available on all of the bank loans and friends and family financing and, uh, and, and various other sources of capital and bootstrapping that are happening. So I suspect that 83% is significantly understated. So which source of capital is, uh, is best for your company? Um, you know, there are at least 30 and maybe 40 major categories of sources, but most of the press goes to uh, angel investment and, uh, and venture capital. Um, we're going to run a little poll in a minute on so I'm gonna I'm gonna run the second poll just to keep this interactive because talking heads get get pretty boring. So where are you in the capital raising process today? I'm gonna launch that poll real quickly. Um, I can try that again, Lulu. And as as was stated earlier, we can. Uh, I'm hoping everyone's seeing that poll now. Yep, yep. I'm starting to see some answers coming in to uh, benchmark who's with us today. All right, so we've got some answers there. Just you know, just preparing and learning. Um, 
this, this is not that dissimilar than the first question. And so we'll probably get some similar answers. We've started approaching investors, 24%. My experience is, and you'll see this a little later, most people start approaching investors way too early because of some uh, myths that are not correct, which as I said, are, are propagated by the press. So we'll share, share those results quickly. Yeah, 53% are, uh, are starting now. So, okay, let's, uh, let's move on. VCs are the best when these conditions are met. And lots of people fail and go sideways and, and waste a lot of time and even go bankrupt because they're targeting the wrong source of capital um, in their stage of development. A VC um, capital needs to exceed you know, 10 million generally. Again, there are always exceptions to this. There are people that call themselves VCs that are you know, smaller angel funds and things like that. So you've got to be careful. But um, VCs, you know, you typically have to have a strong team. And that means three founders. Um, I meet a lot of early stage founders that greatly underestimate, or I'm sorry, overestimate their ability to raise capital because they think their idea is worth millions. And I'm going to blow up that myth um, fairly shortly because an idea is not worth millions and having an idea does not create pre-money valuation or that much interest from investors. This is a, a myth propagated by the press. And, um, you know, everyone will have a story. They'll point out Google and, you know, Microsoft and all these other things. And if you dig in and look at the reality, it's not true that their idea itself was worth any money. It was the value they created in the business with the team and the product and the business plan and the research. Um, VCs want at least a billion dollar market. They want a secret sauce. Uh, intellectual, which can be, come from intellectual property. SCA is short for uh, sustainable competitive advantages. And it's one of my bugaboos that almost no presentations I see at angel investor meetings, and I've seen many hundreds, really talk about the sustainable competitive advantage, which will probably evolve over time. It might start as you know, a lead in the marketplace and build to network effects and, and more intellectual property and gaining a lead and, um, you know, having an advantage by being a big player early in a market. But if you want a venture capital investment, you have to be able to put barriers to entry to protect your margins and your business long term. Uh, because they need an exit in five years. They're less interested in what the business is today and more interested in that five, six, seven year exit when they have to pay back their, uh, their partners in the fund and get some liquidity on the investment. Um, typically, VCs will want to see people on the team that have made money for investors before. Uh, obviously, there are many exceptions to that, um, but you'll find out if you look at the history of you know, Google and others, you know, when you've got a young team of founders, typically they're hiring the gray hair in the background um, and bringing in much more experienced people in operations. You know, and, and if you don't do that, you wind up with the fire scenario, uh, you know, where they they ran that event on an island and, you know, they had great marketing and hype, but they didn't know how to operate. And um, it crashed and burned because they didn't have any real experience on the team. Uh, the same is true of Thor Theranos and, and Elizabeth Holmes. She you know, proved very good at, at raising money, although she was committing fraud and lying to the investors all along, but she didn't know how to run a company or operate or, or get the technology moving. Um, and, and you may need a VC and more capital if there's sort of a land grab where you've potentially, you know, got lots of competitors coming in behind you. And so you need to grab uh, market share early. Um, this, I'm not going to run through all of this. This is here really for reference, but counter to popular belief, even well-funded companies that go through two and three rounds of series A and B financing from venture capitalists often fail. And even the best investors 
are only going to have about a 50% uh, success rate typically um, in, in uh, well-funded. You know, these, these are companies that have received 20, 30, 50 million dollars in funding. Uh, and it's not unusual to see those companies um, go bankrupt for a wide variety of reasons. Um, angels are, are the best and, and most smaller companies should cap angels early in their life, but, but not later in their life. Typically, once you've got some cash flow and can tap into other sources, but if your capital need, and by that, I mean, to get profitable is between a half a million and 2 million. Um, or you want to take that money to really drive up the valuation before you get institutional investment. And we'll show you a graph of that shortly, the, the big milestones that bump your valuation quite a bit and how you should plan those and, and really sell those to investors as well. Um, you, you need, if you need to finish a product or start selling, um, you know, angels are a little more open to that. Um, it's, you know, it's famous today to talk about how most VCs require some traction and sales. Um, that's been correcting a little bit, but in the old days, in the early days of venture capital, um, they funded product development and very few companies are doing that today. You know, unless you've got a real superstar rock star team, um, and, you know, a huge market opportunity and, you know, all the stars align. So typically, um, angels are, are a good source of capital for most earlier stage companies in seed deals. Uh, and sometimes even series A's can be done by syndicates of angels, um, you know, who can pull together a two million. Well, you'll, you'll see in the resources in the Dropbox directory, there's a, a map of the process of Koretsu, who is, uh, they claim to be the biggest, and I don't have reason to disbelieve them, network of angels globally. I think they have about 25 or 30 chapters around the globe now. And, and so they have a very mature systematized process of doing due diligence. And they solve one of the serious problems of angel investing, which is no individual angel wants to do all that due diligence work. And so they, they typically will put together a team of, uh, of experts to do a due diligence package on a, on a company. Um, but they charge about 10 grand as the price of admission to the, uh, the entrepreneur or the company, um, which is unusual because obviously if they're raising money, um, that might be a big nut for a smaller company. But you know, the angel syndicates and angel platforms are growing and becoming much bigger. Um, if you have a more complex idea, um, you may be able to find angels with domain experience. Uh, angels do like to invest locally. So most of your networking should probably be local for angels, although obviously that's uh, expanding um, to, to larger geographies because of the platforms and the ability to use social networks to communicate and share due diligence. Um, local businesses, you know, as angels like to invest locally, uh, and so that's certainly the sweet spot. Uh, I would guess that, you know, probably 70 or 80 percent of angel investments are still tend to be local that, you know, even with COVID, you know, people want to be able to see the company, make sure you're not a fly by night organization, get a sense of the credibility and experience of the team and especially the CEO. Um, here's some angel statistics. I won't read all of these to you. They're here for reference. Um, in my experience, every angel round I've ever done has averaged about 50,000 um, because there's a mix of 25 and 50 and 100. Um, and it's amazing how close uh, that average has come for me. But on a broader basis, uh, 38,000 is uh, reported as one of the uh, statistics uh, by American Angel Report on the average investment an angel makes. And obviously, if you're bootstrapping and putting in uh, sweat equity, you know, that 38,000, even from one angel or, you know, or, or up to half a million can take a company a long way in terms of product development. Um, but it's not going to meet the needs of every company that might have high critical mass. Um, the average angel, um, and, and I didn't know this until I saw this particular statistic, is supposed to have 10 to 12 companies in their portfolio. 
So obviously with that average investment of 38,000, that's implying uh, 380,000 to 456,000 in invested capital uh, for your average angel out there. So they tend to be very active uh, and they tend to work in groups and congregate, but they're hard to find without quality networking. And that's because they'd be drowned in approaches um, if they advertise themselves. Um, what I call super angels, other people have different names for them, um, you know, will invest a, a quarter million and they're typically going to have a 10 million to 100 million net worth. Um, 32% are, are in, in the older age group, uh, 44% are over 61. So, you know, you're going to be talking to um, a demographic that is experienced and, uh, and, and older. Um, angels can be gut feel investors. Um, they may invest based on the feelings they get because they're interested in a particular segment, or maybe they have a socially conscious mission and they want to invest in something that's going to have uh, an impact, you know, what's called impact investing or ESG sometimes today by the, the bigger, bigger companies. I spoke at a, at a conference in November on uh, ESG uh, investing. Uh, and it's, you know, seems to be really uh, taking off like fire. People want to know that their money is being put to work in socially conscious businesses today. And there's a lot of investment groups um, helping that happen. Um, some invest, I apologize, by the way, for not, you know, usually these bullets are coming out one by one. But since we're having a technical problem, um, you're, you're seeing the whole slide. So stick with me here. Um, many uh, angel investors do it for fun. There's a certain psychic uh, feedback and commitment and fulfillment they're getting. Uh, and they enjoy working with the younger entrepreneurs who maybe haven't built a big company yet, but gathered a lot of experience, probably working in a mix of uh, hopefully startups as well as larger companies, um, gaining their management experience uh, and, and super angels. Um, are, that are over 20 million in net worth often can invest at 500k. They're particularly hard to find, and they usually have a much more structured process. And you know they'll hire an accountant and other people for due diligence because obviously they're making a a, a much bigger commitment. Um, Crowdfunding is growing like mad um, in the area of doubling every year. And, and so if you know the old, you know, double the grain of rice thing, it's, uh, it's probably going to be quite big in the next um, several years and uh, it, it is growing like mad. But it has a limited application because crowdfunding is viable mainly for very simple consumer products. Um, it's best when you can easily show it. I mean, typically the crowdfunding success is going to be based on the quality of the video um, that you're going to produce to uh, tell the story. Uh, and, and so it's important that you budget for, you know, spending money and um, editing and creating a good video. Um, it often can work very well if you have a customer list from selling your product. Kickstarter, which is one of the first crowdfunding pl platforms, you know, generally funds prototypes that aren't done or the first production run. They may have a prototype and they're, they're showing it and making promises, but lots of those companies will never achieve the promises because they have an inexperienced management team and they, they overestimate their ability to deliver. So you've got to really look at the team uh, and where the product is. Uh, and, and most crowdfunding people are investing, you know, $100 to $500 at a pop. So they're not going to be doing a lot of due diligence. So that's why it's very dependent on the video. Um, if you need 100000 to a million, that's sort of the sweet spot of crowdfunding. Uh, it's recently expanded to uh, there was a $5 million cap on a type A uh, crowdfunding and by regulation. And that recently went up to $20 million, I believe. So it's easy to expand that and do future crowdfunding and kind of skip over venture capital immediately. But you better have a good marketing and sales pitch and a way to generate leads because the platforms 
aren't going to sell all those customers for you. It's really up to you to um, to manage that pipeline and leads and feed people through the process and you know hold webinars to discuss your company and answer questions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not an it's not Nirvana um, crowdfunding, and uh, there's a lot of work involved. And, and typically, you're going to spend five to ten thousand um, dollars on the video and setup and uh, in marketing and all of the things you have to do uh, to make that happen. So um, you've got to budget that, and and and, t- and and you know it's going to take ninety days typically from the decision to do a crowdfunding round uh, to the, the the launch and and potentially seeing the first money. Um, but you better have good marketing and sales uh, experience on your team. So some false beliefs that cause the wrong mindset and often failure because people don't, um, don't uh, correct for these false beliefs, okay? Only 1% of companies uh, or less will get preventure, uh, professional venture capital because there's good quality or overlap in these four areas. Obviously, team, um, the right experience on the team is, you know, if this were weighted, it would probably be 75% because a good team can fix anything uh, and make adjustments and pivots. Um, The market we talked about being a billion dollars for VCs, the idea being good enough. Um, You know, people think that the idea is the key to a business. And, you know, I I equate the idea to a steering wheel in a race car. you got to have one and it's got to be a good one, but it's not really what builds uh, success. It creates opportunity, but all businesses pivot and iterate and improve. Uh, And then the circle of finance is about, you know, you've got to have the right margin. Margins, typically more than 50% gross margins are required. Uh, obviously, in software and SaaS and other areas, you know, you can potentially see 90% gross margins um, that make those a little easier to, uh, to finance because when you get to scale, lots of that gross margin begins to, uh, to drop down to your bottom line. So there's a lot of specialists in the in the SaaS online and app areas now um, that understand that a lot of capital will be needed up front, uh, but you'll wind up um, having customers that are locked in for the long term. And so the lifetime value of those customers is good. We, we were doing SaaS like deals back in the 1980s when I was founder of um, Thompson Financial Services, which is um, Thompson Reuters today, because we essentially charged a monthly fee and gave them the software and the hardware. And uh, at the time, a lot of proprietary built networks, but it was essentially a SaaS rental of the software model with us providing the, um, uh, the, the hardware as well to control that when it was necessary because we didn't have the power that PCs have today. Um, This number two that you kind of can't believe if you want to be successful is that, you know, great pitch deck is all I need. Uh, A lot of the younger entrepreneurs and early stage people, um, think that if they have a a well-designed, fancy graphics pitch deck, that's going to bring in investors. Uh, And that's not true because, you know, really that's, that's the, the shine on the apple and the apple is what matters is, is your business model and your vision um, going to generate a sustainable competitive advantage? And that's team plus product um, plus market fit you know, figuring out your market fit, that's what creates pre-money valuation. And anyone thinks they're going to get a $10 million pre-money valuation because they've got an idea is going to constantly fail with that expectation because no one's going to pay to get into a company and buy equity when it hasn't yet created some real value in the company. Um, whether that's proof of concept or building a prototype and, and building the team, we'll show you a graph shortly of the big jumps in valuation that happen. Uh, and there are valuation methods that, uh, um, that quantitatively look at that. So raising money is about showing you've done your homework and you've pulled together a team 
you've created a business that can have sustainable competitive advantage that is going to last and, and build uh, barriers to entry that will protect your margins long term. Um, raising money is, is about lowering investor risk, right? And bootstrapping is one of the best ways to do that, keeping your costs very low for the first year or two while you're building a product in stealth mode. Whether this is a mature company that's doing a spin-off and a new product or a raw startup, um, I, I believe the same is true. And the discipline of bootstrapping sort of forces you to, um, to make sure that you have market validation of the product. Most companies fail because they don't do their homework. They don't do their market research. They don't do their competitive intelligence. Um, and they don't tune the business model to uh, allow um, for a, um, a powerful business during market entry. So raising money is also about approaching the right investors, targeting, like in all of marketing, you know, if you start with the wrong list of people, you're going to fail. And so sometimes, you know, 90% of success can be about the financing strategy and going after the right investors. And I don't, don't mean just the category of investors of angels or VCs or, you know, or strategic partners or whatever. I mean, picking within that category to go after the right investors. Um, deals get shop worn. And if you, you know, carpet bomb the, you know, the investment community with your pitch deck and your business plan, um, that's gonna hurt you. So you only want to approach investors that are appropriate. Uh, myth number three that I want to bust about invade, you know, raising capital that, again, is, is sometimes a, a common belief because the press don't understand this, and I already mentioned it to some degree, is that your ideas are worth million. It's actually mathematically provable that that's not the case. Um, I know and, and worked with a little bit the, um, uh, the family, it was a husband and wife team that owns patents on um, the uh, uh, second uh, validation of, of doing, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank spot in my mind right now, but uh, when, you, when you get a code uh, for secondary uh, valuation of identity, and they had patents on that in multiple countries, and they never earned a penny from it because they expected investors would pay them for that patent when they really hadn't done anything to build the company. And even if you have an exclusive on an idea in the form of a patent, and that assumes there aren't ways to work around the patent, you're still only going to get two to 5% royalty. And so that's sort of mathematical proof that your idea is, is almost never worth millions because even if you have an exclusive patent, uh, the percentage um, that's gonna go to the founders, the investors and other stakeholders that actually build the company is gonna exceed or, or at least be 95%. Um, ideas are, are legally and easily stolen and replicated. Someone can dump a lot of capital on it after you've proven the market and the business model. Um, there are, you know, a hundred to a thousand people with the same idea typically, and it's very rare that the idea hasn't, um, been looked at by many other people, but pulling together that team that's capable of, uh, of executing is, is the key. Uh, most lack the vision, the management skills, um, the leadership, and of course, an ability to raise capital, which is you know the topic today. But there are thousands of ways to fail, um, and only an experienced team. And and by that I mean team experienced in product development, team experienced in marketing, and team experienced in building and managing people in a company. So typically, that's your CEO, your head of product development, and who's ever ahead of your sales and marketing. Those are the first team members that you have to have lined up and committed, hopefully with sweat equity um, in, in the business. Um, so uh, I, I don't wanna harp on this too much. I won't read all of this, but you know, it's, it's important that you get out of that mindset that your idea is worth millions because only then can you actually spend the time building the value that investors are really going to invest in. Um, 
some facts that you know take a long time to learn because most people out there raising capital are doing it for the first or second time and they don't have a lot of time to learn or adjust um, there are a lot of charlatans that will you know promise to introduce you to investors and try to get a fee which technically is illegal under SEC rules because they can't take a percentage of the deal without having a, a Series 7 or an SEC license to, uh, to sell securities. Um, so I would stay away from founders, uh, I'm sorry, finders uh, generally, um, as most of them are not going to provide a lot of value. Um, they tend to be uh, opportunistic and they might blast your deal to a bunch of people that they sort of know and, and just by luck and numbers, you know, they might get you a meeting or two, but you'll actually probably be a second tier deal and introduction uh, if anyone thinks you're raising funds. If, if, an, if a venture capitalist find out that you promised a percentage of the deal um, to a finder, they really dislike that because it shows a certain naivete and lack of experience and their capital um, is, is being wasted. Um, money is the ultimate commodity. You know, we all tend to beg at the altar of, of money and venture capitalists have grown very used to that because they've got a line of 400 people out the door, you know, that want them to invest. And, and, and so there's a, an imbalance in the supply and demand in the marketplace. But obviously, money is a commodity. Um, I'm going to show you some slides later of how valuations are trending up nicely. And there's more money flowing in um, to these kinds of deals now in the VC and the angel space as well, which is good news for, for entrepreneurs and people that are scaling their business. Uh, but quality management teams are really the rare resource. Um, and it's tough to build them and have the level of commitment that's needed. Um, and, and I find a lot of founders are, are kind of too cheap to be successful. And they don't understand that they need to hire these skills. Now, they can use equity and stock options, or they can use cash. Obviously, equity is easy in the early days to bring in founders, and it can give people a you know, multi-million dollar or 10 million plus dollar upside. And so you have to know how to leverage that to create value in the company in your bootstrapping before you have capital coming in. Um, I see so many companies that go sideways for years because they're too cheap to hire the expertise they need. And the fact is that a professional can do in minutes and just knows the right thing to do. What someone doing it for the first time uh, might take months or years to figure out. And so you got to be prepared to spend a little money when you're raising capital um, to put your financing strategy together and to, uh, to attract um, the right people. So another fact that can take decades to learn is uh, company selection is very hard. Um, we saw earlier that even venture capitalists that invest two times in a company doing a series A and a series B still often, and that, that graph was the best people. It's not the average people in venture capital, and they're still only getting 50% of their companies making it after having $20 million to figure it out. I, I like to say I could probably start an ice company in Alaska with $20 million. Um, and it might be a little exaggeration, but probably not a lot if you stay in a bootstrapping kind of mode and use that capital well, and don't let the company get too big too quick to have a high burn rate while you're figuring out your product market fit. Um, but if a team is strong, they're going to be able to pivot and fix just about any problem, which is why the, the old VC mantra, management, 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 you know, is, is the most important thing. It's like in real estate, location, 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 right? Uh, the, uh, the bulk of your success will be a function of who's on your your team, and again, I mean that in product development and marketing, the two hardest things to do, Peter Drucker, the father of management, always says, uh, or said, I should say, he's deceased, um, that a company has two jobs. One is innovation, and the second is marketing. And the reality is, not to disparage other skill sets, 
But the reality is the others are more commoditized and the creativity and the ability to find people to do your accounting and your operations, you know, it's just much easier. It's very hard to find creative, successful people um, that do product development and, you know, in, in software where I started my career, you know, a, a good software engineer or a great software engineer can do 10 times what an average software engineer can do. And so if you have a couple of those on your team, you're way ahead of the game because your overhead and your costs relative to the rate of innovation and the product value you create uh, is going to be a, a great ratio. So ultimately, very important. And, and I'm going to give you a tool shortly to evaluate your team. Um, here's the good news I mentioned a little earlier. Valuations are trending up nicely in the drop box that we provided. You'll find a big report from Pitch Deck. Um, this is a sample of sort of the surveys that will give you some averages on what valuations are today uh, and, and how they're trending and other important statistics. Um, you know, what percentage of, of the company a founder is able to keep when they raise certain amounts of money and things like that. So I won't spend a lot of time on this because we're giving you a uh, reference uh, on that. So here's the graph I referred to earlier. And you'll see every time this line pivots up, you're meeting a milestone. And this must be mapped into your financing strategy and your bootstrapping strategy, because reaching those milestones allows your valuation to potentially double or triple because the risk of the investment is going down rapidly at that point. And although this is oversimplified, you'll see that, you know, getting the team, you're sort of still in an angel space, you know, unless you've got a rock star team and, you know, then you might be able to get a 10 or $20 million pre-money valuation out of the, uh, the box. If, you know, they all made money for investors before and have a big market and check all the boxes. So there's always those, you know, top 1% or, or 3% exceptions. But you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want hope to be your strategy, right? You've got to work the deal to build your team, then work the deal to build your product. And you'll see after you have a product that that line, you know, shoots almost straight up. So once you've got a working product and you've taken, you know, in some cases, technology risk, in other cases, marketing and sales risk, because you can now show the product to people and figure out your close rate and do the math on sales and marketing, figure out what your customer acquisition cost is. You know, that's the other things that are happening as that line uh, starts to skyrocket and both your probability of closing financing and your valuation are, are correlated there and going up very rapidly. I meet a lot of founders that, you know, want to hire their best buddy out of college to do their programming and they've got no experience. And uh, as gently as I can, I tell them that's a suicide strategy. You know, you can't have a new programmer competing with someone with 10 years experience. Um, your, your chances of success are going to be near zero with that kind of strategy. So, you know, yeah, you can go and hire, hire that person, but they're going to learn from someone with a lot more experience. Uh, and that applies to everything. It's not just software. Um, so the major milestones are listed here and you'll see the inflection points where they start to, that curve starts to go up very rapidly labeled one through four. I won't read all of this to you. Um, let's take a quick pause. And if someone wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, we'll, we'll take a couple minutes and I'm going to uh, also um, launch uh, the third poll, which I think is due now. Uh, Anyone uh, want to pipe in with a question? Obviously, you can put it in the chat box. You can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Um, but here's the third poll. And the question is, how much do you need to raise to become profitable? Uh, and you should have a simulator of the business, not just a P&L. A lot of companies make the mistake of just having a P&L, which is sort of a snapshot of one scenario. I'm really big on the CEO having a simulator so that as things change and they will and new information flows in, you can constantly update the spreadsheet that you use for projections 
and it will calculate your company valuation and your stock price and, and various other things. I've been building those since I launched my first startup in the, in the 1980s, and they really help um, set the metrics, and they're really going to help you close investors because essentially you're selling them a stock and you're telling them, and by the time we spend your money and reach the next milestone, you know, the price of that stock should double or triple. And so they see the opportunity. And if you're focused on completing that milestone and have budgeted it properly in time and money, um, you're going to have that. So we have 43% of people, I'm going to end the poll and share that poll. 43% or 40% are under a million. Um, I'm hoping everyone's seeing that now. It says it's sharing. Um, about 33% are looking for one to five million. So they're either in the angel syndicate uh, area or the professional venture capital area, probably, although that's not the only source. Um, we've got 20% of people on the call that are seeking to raise five to 10 million and over 10 million is 7%. So the further you get up in that capital need, the more you have to focus on attracting uh, quality team. So I hope that that helps some feedback. That's quite a, quite a mix. And um, the strategy you need for each of those four levels is very different because you've got a different target investor and you need to uh, reach these milestones um, uh, differently and be able to tell the story and obviously paint that picture. But it's all about the team, um, the market opportunity, which is not the idea. Don't confuse idea with market. A market is your defined target market. I've got a question, well, Bob. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Carl, go ahead. Uh, how would you suggest that uh, people think about pre-money valuation and deal terms? Well, those are big questions. I mean, I could spend you know fifteen or, or thirty minutes answering each of those, and it's the, the the truth is it depends on your exact situation. Um, deal terms have standardized a lot. You may have heard of the safe note for early investments, um, and you know your your lawyer and others will will know what the market is for pre money valuations. In the Dropbox, I put some statistical studies on that from uh, Pitch Deck. There's about, a, I think it's a 25 page report that answers uh, statistically some of those things for you. But it, it, for an angel deal, um, I most often use a convertible note. I've put a sample of that in the Dropbox for you as well. And that tends to get around all the SEC regulations. You typically want to only take accredited investors that are sophisticated and can afford to lose their money. The smaller amount they invest, the more of a pain in the butt they typically are. So, you know, I would recommend sticking with accredited and sophisticated investors. Obviously, your family might be an exception to that, but as they say, it can make an awful uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner. Um, you know, if you crash and burn and, uh, and Aunt Jane put in $25,000. Um, and, and so you obviously want to be careful in how you uh, you manage that. So deal terms, you know, are obviously negotiable. Venture capitalists have a lot of strings that they attach to the business. Um, I would say the trend is that some of those are getting more entrepreneur friendly. Um, the regular convertible note is what I still use, but there are advantages to the safe note, which was put out by Y Combinator. And you can Google that and find a sample of that as well. Um, but they will vary an awful lot. I mean, obviously, a founder wants to, to keep some control early on and have 50%. If they put in some capital and they do a good job of bootstrapping, that should be a slam dunk to maintain 50%. There are people that, you know, will take in 250 grand and, you know, they'll do it so early, they give up half their company. And so they lose control very early in the business. Uh, and that's not usually good because the investors don't necessarily have 100% alignment with the founders and the management team. You know, they're looking for, you know, rapid growth, uh, an exit in five years. And so, you know, you'll wind up with a board 
that isn't agreeing if you don't work out all those terms. So, you know, like any deal, you know, it's a marriage and you want to have a prenup that figures out all of those things and make sure that your philosophy uh, is aligned. And, you know, that's one of the bigger problems with getting venture capital. You're giving up a lot of control because they have a lot of strings uh, attached to that and, and void voting positions. And I have seen venture capitalists run companies into bankruptcy that should have done better because they're impatient and they, they want to have certain growth rates. Um, and, and so you've got to be really careful with those deal terms. Um, I'll probably hold the webinar later that will go into that, but I, I'd read that, uh, um, the report from uh, Pitch Deck and, and reference you to that with uh, lots of answers on what is typical in, um, in terms today. Um, this, I think, is one of the most important slides, and we're running out of time, so I, I, I want to finish up. But this is, you know, I think what most people need as sort of the dose of truth and reality to benchmark their own team. And obviously, you know, you have to interpolate, you know, level two and three and, and, and eight. But I think that you, could, you should be able to do that. And I would sit down and be brutally honest with yourself about which of these criteria you're going to meet. If you want to raise venture capital from institutional investors, you're probably going to have to be a nine or a 10 or maybe an eight if you're lucky and in a good hot space. You know, if you're in AI or, or crypto or, you know, those areas that are very hot, um, you know, you might be able to drop a point or a level off of this today or two. Um, but typically, like I said, you don't want luck to be your strategy. Um, you want to work what you know works and will get deals closed. And so most everyone is going to start on day one at level one. They're going to bootstrap. They may have some friends and families, or some people call it friends and families and fools, um, because Typically, people going into those deals don't, they're not sophisticated and they don't understand um, the risks and the failure rate of startups. Uh, and, and so most people are going to lose their entire investment on, uh, on angel investment and angel investors have to diversify and, you know, should have, should plan on having 10 deals if they're going to be a real angel investor to have that, that diversification. So I'm, I'm going to keep moving on, but you know, I would suggest everyone sit down and figure out what level you're at because you're going to need a level five or close to that to bring in angel money. And you're going to you know, need a level nine or 10 uh, later if you want to bring in big bucks from institutional investors that are going to have a very high bar for the quality of the management team, the size of the deal. Um, you know, this is meant to be a very objective, you know, come to Jesus meeting to say, are you going after money that you can expect to be successful raising? And if you're not uh, you're not meeting these criteria, um, you're probably wasting your time or you're at least rolling the dice and hoping to get lucky. Um, we already ran that poll. So here's a slide. And, you know, the, when I was raising money early in the 80s, I, I don't think people did these slides, but it's a standard slide format now um, showing the team and what they bring to the party. Um, another way of, you know, kind of selling what you've got on the team, which is number one for a quality investor, right? So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but to me, these are sort of minimums if you want to raise a significant amount of capital. And, you know, by significant, I mean a million or two million or more. You know, you ought to be thinking about checking these boxes. And obviously, no one checks these boxes on day one. You know, your level one management team on day one, but your goal is to leverage your equity, to leverage your ability to sell a vision and to get people committed. You know, they might be part time, they might be virtual, um, they might be putting in sweat equity, or you might have to pay them um, some money to build a prototype. But you know, this is what it's going to take if you want to raise big capital. And, you know, as I said in, in previous slides, the product development person, the CEO and the sales and marketing person 
are, are the most important. The others can be added later and they're easier to find because those skills are more horizontal across all industries too. Um, what makes a strong business idea? A dramatic improvement. You know, people used to say 10x, not 2x improvement in technology. It's better, faster, cheaper. If you're going to ask a new customer um, to, to work with a, a new product, they're, they're taking risk, right? And so they've got to see a very significant um, uh, benefit to them to take that risk. Um, there's an old saying, and I think it's a great one, and that is <clears throat> um, start, startups um, will make it if they get distribution before the incumbents get innovation, right? And, and so you have a window of opportunity when you launch a new product or business to grab some market share, get some cash flow, form a beachhead in a smaller niche. And you know, if you can remain in stealth mode longer and make your product robust and improve it and then expand the markets later. This is one of the, the top things that um, entrepreneurs and, and people seeking investment don't do. They don't map out a multi-step market entry strategy because a startup should be going into a smaller niche, even though that ultimate market five years out might be a billion dollars they might be going after a niche that only has $50 million or $100 million in sales with their MVP and their first launch of the product to get established and cash flow. Um, the barriers to entry uh, you know, are, are required. I, you know, I keep harping on that because I think it's the most important thing. I think there are investors out there that don't look enough at it, but I think the quality investors you know, that's the big question for them. Is the management team articulating a story that shows how barriers to entry are going to come up around this business? Because that's what's going to protect your margins and allow rapid growth um, by feeding the cash flow into sales and marketing and additional product development to stay ahead of the competition. Um, uh, and, and does it complement available products? I mean, this is something I think you know, newer entrepreneurs tend not to understand. You want people to not view you as a competitor. You'd like to view, be viewed as a complementary product. So established players with distribution will resell and cooperate with you. The, the old co-opetition, it's called in, in Silicon Valley, um, whereby, you know, potentially you could be competitors, but you could also cooperate in, uh, in building sales and distribution. And obviously scalability, I mean, that's a big word and means a lot of things, but typically products are pretty scalable, whereas services are much harder to scale because you have to hire and train a lot of people uh, as opposed to ramping up manufacturing or app downloads or, or whatever a product uh, limitation might be. So a little, a little commercial break here. Um, I have put together a package to help companies raise financing that includes helping them um, develop a, a multi-step financial strategy that will uh, allow investors to see the bumps and have the right uh, model uh, associated with it. It will allow a multi-step market entry strategy. I mean, this is what we teach in the CEO bootcamp and Elon Musk has always done this. Um, you know, you start with a, a higher priced product in a small niche where the need is greatest, and then you expand from there. So I'm offering uh, $900 off on this package because I, I want to, I've done this for, you know, for decades helping people, but I've kind of formalized it as a flat rate project now to take people through everything that's needed. It might take your company four weeks to get through this. It might take your company eight weeks to get through this. You know, you've got to do the homework because this, is co this isn't doing it for you. This is doing it with you and coaching you through the process. And, you know, I can pretty much guarantee I'll double or triple your chances of raising capital 
by applying my experience and getting all of these things right. Um, I have 190 <laughs> slides and we're only getting through 30 today and we'll be adding uh, more training that drills down and gets more specific. And people in this package will obviously have access to that training as it becomes available too. But more importantly, the, the coaching and the consulting that designs a story, a pitch deck, a financing strategy and a market entry strategy, which are the key things that any investor is looking for. It doesn't matter if they're a venture capitalist or a good angel investor. Um, they're they're going to want to see those three or four things. You know, a team being the fourth, but but number one, and then market entry strategy, financing strategy, <clears throat> and obviously the the whole business model and the uh, the cycle of profits. So, um, well, this is a list of, you know, very high level, what all outside investors would look at. And that's why this particular webinar is really about any type of investor. Um, these are the foundational blocks and, and philosophies that you need to understand to close any investor. Um, you've got to have a large enough market, as we talked about, depending on the, the category or source of funds. You've got to have a plan with a couple committed management team members. Uh, the old gets hit by a bus scenario comes up, right? So people don't want to depend on on um, just one founder, they want a couple that are married and committed, and, and that means they have a lot of equity in the company. Typically, early founders you know, should have 5 or 10% minimum. Uh, in the Dropbox we left you, we, uh, we've provided some bonus slides and other things um, that also have some averages for equity that is given. And of course, it's very dependent on the stage and how much sweat equity they're going to put in the business and, and those sorts of things. But commitment means equity in this sentence, right? It means they're tied into the success of the company. Hopefully they're investing their own time and money um, as a vote of confidence in um, their ability to see the future success of the company. Um, they've got to understand the business model, uh, which is, you know, the financial model. Um, this, you know, what's the sustainable competitive advantage that's going to be able to be maintained? Sometimes that will change over time. Um, you know, everyone probably knows Metcalf's law, which is the network effect that says the, the value of a network is the square of the number of members. And so you see an exponential curve. But that's just one of about 30 different ways to create sustainable competitive advantage in a marketplace. Obviously, you know, uh, social media like Facebook and Twitter, you know, have that. Um, people go there because the audience is already there. Um, number five, the financial projection model. Uh, and again, I, I call this a simulator because I want to be able to set it up so that the main driving variables are separated out and I can change them and instantly calculate things. For instance, if you, know, you do a price change or you learn your closing rate is better or worse, you want to sit down and, and sort of like a GPS, instantly recalibrate where you're going uh, based on that. And a lot of companies make the mistake of hiring a CFO to do a P&L, which is a static snapshot of one scenario instead of a simulator, which can be updated as you learn things and you're guaranteed to be learning things uh, as you enter the market. Um, so let's do poll number four. That's the bulk of our presentation for today. We'll go into more q and I'm going to ask one more question. And hopefully from today's uh, discussion, you'll be able to answer this question better um, now than you could uh, an hour and 18 minutes ago, I guess. I'm running a little late uh, because we had a technical problem and, and I'm, I'm known for talking too much, <laughs> but I'm trying to cram a lot of value in here for everybody. Can you just please clarify what's the difference between family offices and angel investors? Family offices is like sure. private equity. Or yeah, no? a family office is when a wealthy family allocates a certain amount of money to a fund and they hire people to run that fund. So it's sort of like a little venture capital fund, but it's family money. So for instance, the Egan's who founded EMC have a family office. 
And just like any venture capitalist, they're going to have a mission statement. They're going to have certain areas they want to invest in. Um, they, they have become more popular as there are kind of more wealthy, you know, a lot of them tech investors, right, made their money in tech. And so now they have $100 million to manage. And so rather than put that in one or two venture capital funds as limited partners, which they might do also, they take a chunk of that money and they hire a couple of people to evaluate deals and do investments. And, you know, some of them might do only real estate, others, you know, might do only technology or software, just like every venture capital fund. um, They're probably going to have a certain limited areas that they're willing to invest in. And so just like angel investors, you know, you've got a network and uh, and find these people and make sure they're good matches. Everything's about targeting like any other thing in marketing. If you start with a bad list, you know, you're not going to be very successful. So you've got to decide on not just the best category of investor, i.e. angel or family office or PE or VC. You've got to decide, you've got to then go to the next level and target the best 50 or 100 investors that, that you're going to want to approach and pitch. And, and the numbers but are in gonna... terms of risk, sorry to interrupt you, but in terms of risk, would you say the which which ones are the most risk? <coughs> sorry, oh, risk, angel risk angel investors. Yeah, angel investors are generally willing to take the most risk because mm. they invest earlier. Um, family offices would probably be less risk, although I've seen recently family offices doing, you know, seed stage deals, but typically they're a little more risk adverse than your average angel investor. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then venture capitalists, you know, they probably take half or less the risk of an angel investor because they want to see a product done. They want to see traction or sales. Um, and, and, and in the in the folder, the Dropbox folder, you'll find some uh, some data on that. Uh, and the average, uh, you know, for for there's some benchmarks of like for SaaS companies, um, the average revenue that they would expect before they would invest as a VC. So as you go up that that life cycle, um, those companies want to take less and less risk. Uh, as they add more um, more capital or invest more capital. So here, here's the results. We've got 33, 33 35% that uh, are, uh, believe angels are the best source for them. And, and that's a typical mm-hmm. venture capital investors, 29%. Um, crowdfunding, as, I, as I've said, is, is growing like mad and great if you're a consumer company. Um, family offices are, are a little harder to profile because they're, they're all over the map in terms of what they're willing to do, just like individual venture capital funds. And I'd, I'd love to hear from some of you in the Q&A session um, what the others are. I mean, corporate partners. I, I did a deal with IBM for $34 million um, for HomeView, which was the first high-definition virtual touring company for residential real estate um, that I founded back in 1989. And so we were a startup, but we got a huge investment from IBM uh, in its uh, desire to diversify um, Adam Caper, who was on and was the guy who, who left earlier, uh, specialized in uh, in putting together uh, venture funds for corporations that want to make strategic investments. I guess I got got a couple more slides here, real quickly. What are the best investors done it before? Um, I'll let you read these guys because we're short on time. And um, there's a couple slides here. This this is for reference. The, the image on the right is the classic conventional view of what should be in your pitch deck. Um, I would argue it's missing the five things that I put on the right that should also be in there. And they might be in some of these same slides. But as I said, most are missing sustainable competitive advantage. And that's going to show you're a more sophisticated uh, CEO. Um, they're, most of them are missing a market entry strategy. They might talk about one product as opposed to a series of products or a series of markets. Um, we, we often do a, a portfolio of niches as a market entry strategy or a portfolio of products in the same vertical market so that there will be shared uh, customer value and upsells. Um, 
what's your ideal customer profile? Very important today, especially because of online marketing. You've got to, you know, sort of own some keywords and know who your customer is. Of course, Google AdWords and, and other online sources will help you figure that out. Um, the pr proof of value, you know, your unique selling proposition, your USP, you, you want to prove you're differentiated, at least in a niche market. Um, and then, you know, I, I put the team earlier. Uh, a lot of people introduce the team later. There ought to be, you know, in a physical meeting, you know, pressing the flesh, you know, when you can do that today in, in the COVID world um, or even virtually, uh, it's very important to establish credibility. One of the top rules of presenting, you know, is establish your credibility early on. So I don't know why this particular one, you know, asks the team to be number nine. Um, there's some data from online watching. And the, the venture capitalists looking at deals will spend the most time on the team slide and the financial slide. That's where they're going to study. And um, amazingly, you know, the average amount of time they'll spend looking at a pitch deck is under five minutes. But two, two minutes of that will be on the financial slide and two minutes of that will be on the team slide because they're figuring out the profitability of the business model potentially, and obviously the team's ability to execute on that promise. Um, so don't confuse the idea solution, uh, the, the term solution and idea. A solution is your whole business model that solves the customer problem. Uh, and an idea is, you know, sort of the how you're going to do it at the core. But a good company, you know, is going to have hundreds, if not thousands of ideas to make its product better, faster, cheaper, and to, uh, to build barriers to entry. Um, so let me reinforce a couple of the big takeaways that I want you all to have as a mind shift. Um, the, you know, closing investors successfully is not about the pitch deck. It's about the story behind the pitch deck, which is the team, the business model, what's the sustainable competitive advantage, and what's the level of proof or statistics that you have today to reduce the risk to the investor. Do you know what it's going to cost to get a customer or a lead uh, and close a deal? Those are the things that the bigger investors want to see in a more mature company because that makes the financials, instead of just pulling um, numbers out of the air, uh, have some, some real data behind them. Um, you don't want to just do more pitches. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you watched the, uh, the Theranos um, uh, Elizabeth's Home story. I think it's on Hulu now. Um, you know, and, and, you know, she was, you know, running around and frustrated and uh, and, and that's the story of all investors, because most are going to say no. I mean, the famous stories are, you know, are, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken founder Colonel Sanders, you know, had 1100 pitches before he sold his first franchise. Uh, the guy who created uh, Mark Victor Hansen, who created Chicken Soup for the Soul. Um, I forget what the exact number is, but hundreds of people turned him down. And that wound up being a $7 billion book series. So, you know, most people don't have the vision to see what you have, and you've got to connect the dots for them um, by telling that story and, and rolling out a, a growing market entry strategy and the sustainable competitive advantage. The best investors are going to dig into those. Um, you know, you want to ask for hard feedback and criticism. A lot of investors don't want to give you that. They're giving away their time uh, and they don't want to say no, because if you get a lead investor they love later, they don't want to have burned that bridge and they might want to come back in when you've made more progress. Right. So it's hard to get good feedback from investors. Um, and, and, and number four is have a long term financing strategy. Almost no one does this well. Um, you know, they may say, hey, we think we need, you know, 2 million now and 10 million later. That's not a financing strategy. That's pulling numbers out of the air. When you, when you have a real simulator that shows the milestones that will be achieved by the first round of capital uh, and getting there and the bump in valuation, I track my stock price as calculated by the you know, the price to earnings ratios that make sense in that marketplace. So I'm looking at my stock price every quarter or every month. Um, and, and obviously there are big bumps in that when key milestones are reached.
Um, so another quick commercial message. I don't know how many of you are aware of the CEO Bootcamp that is the sponsor of today's free webinar, but um, we put the CEO Bootcamp online and are expanding it now. I've given the CEO Bootcamp since 2004. We've graduated thousands of CEOs and entrepreneurs from over 40 countries now, and I've done it on uh, a few continents. Um, we will be having a live event again at some point, but mainly we're focused now on the online capability so people can take it at any speed they want. Um, we have a 100% money back guarantee, and I like to brag that no one's ever taken that that guarantee because they easily see the $100,000 plus value that we guarantee within a year. Because one idea from this of something you didn't know can tweak your business model or change your ability to raise capital, et cetera, et cetera, and, and really make a difference. So uh, I find that most people who attend this, even sometimes we have 10-year CEOs coming through this that you know, have been running a family business or, or whatever, but had no one to learn from. Uh, and oftentimes they, they don't know 50%. I have Harvard MBAs come through this course and they say, why didn't they you know, why didn't they teach me this when I paid $250,000 for my, uh, my Harvard MBA? And the only answer I can give them is because, because they're academic and this is practical. It's all from my experience. It took me over a year to put together the first CEO boot camp that I ran in 2004. I think we had 40 attendees at that first one and we have video testimonials uh, on the website. Um, I'm going to bring up the chat box now and uh, and open it for questions uh, and, and stop my screen share here. I think I'm I'm done and we'll go to Q and A. Can I start? <laughs> yes, you can. Sure. Okay. So I think first of all, thank you so much. You know, I've read so many things and it's it's actually really hard to stay one hour focused, but the content was really valuable and I kept. You know, it's impossible to take my face now out of the Zoom call. So it was really valuable, all the things you said. But my um, current status right now is I'm looking for funding. I had, you know, the I had myself bootstrapping the company for a long period. Then I had family raising, uh, fundraising. Then I had uh, friends and fools. Um, but right now I need like a business angel or perhaps, you know, as we discussed, a family office. But it's so, and I have the pitch deck, you know, all the things are there. I mean, the only thing I would add, maybe like you said, a simulator instead of being a static financial Excel plan. But where are these people? Like, how can I connect with them? Because it's really hard through LinkedIn with yeah. the investors. So well, in, in the Dropbox, there are some answers to that. The top six ways, there's an article, the top six ways to find angel investors. But the short answer yeah. is networking. You know, you've got to get out there. Lots of entrepreneurs start with a single investor. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have a story. I had, I had someone write a $100,000 check the first time they visited me. But that almost never happens. I mean, that never happened again to me when I was launching HomeView. But we were generations ahead of the, you know, the little black and white pictures in the MLS book. And, you know, we had eight high co color, high mm -hmm. definition pictures. So it was easy to see the huge leap in technology. And the more you can tell that story and, and, and show an advantage over the current market, um, the easier it's going to be to close investors. But lots of people will take 50,000 or 100,000 from one angel in the first round. And the way to do that is to give them a discount. Um, the convertible note sample, which is also in the Dropbox that allows mm -hmm. you to get around all the SEC regulations and not sell stock with all the disclosures, um, allows you to, to write a convertible note and you can give them a discount on the next round. And what that allows you to do is get around pricing the business too, because they're gonna get a discount at a later date when you'll better be able to benchmark the valuation of the business. So they're not taking a risk. So it's not uncommon to see 10 or 20%, sometimes more 25% discounts when they convert to stock on the money they put in. Uh, and these terms vary a lot and it would get, you know, into all kinds of detail that we don't have the time for. 
but you, you know, that's probably your number one tool is a convertible note used as the, the execution or the mechanic of the investment and networking like hell. Um, I think, and, it, where, where are you located? To go, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I am currently, I mean, I am from Portugal, Lisbon. I am okay. actually going to New York in the beginning of April, staying until the end of June, because uh, in Portugal, capital, um, access to capital is very limited, unfortunately. And so, I mean, yeah. things here. Well, there are a lot of angels that only want to invest locally and, and investing in another country is, is a foreign idea to them. So you've got to target those that are willing to do that. Um, but I am you, building. I am building a U.S. company right now, based in right. Dallas. Yeah. So that, that was my first be. suggestion: is incorporating in the U.S. where they understand the laws yeah. and and know what can happen because you know no one wants to hi hire lawyers and and deal with the winding down of a company and in, in a country for the first time because the legal costs alone, you know, might double the loss of your investment. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, have so you but I was just going to ask on, on the cultural aspect, since I am, you know, Mediterranean, European, but, um, how, how do you, people usually like network within the U.S. standards? Do, do, would I go to like networking events? Can you yeah, well, pre-COVID, you would go to physical events networking. Most of those are available online right now. You should join mm -hmm. AngelList. I think it's angellist.co. Maybe someone can correct me on that by putting it in the chat box um, mm -hmm. where, where I'm a member. And um, they have informal syndicates that form whereby mm -hmm. people that do the due diligence get a percentage of the profits for doing that deal. As I mentioned earlier, Koretsu, you know, has a formalized process to make people more comfortable by doing the, the due diligence. Um, and, and so mm -hmm. you've got to join a bunch of their uh, platforms. Um, there, are, there are common platforms to apply. There's a platform called Gust. Um, yeah. You know, and have you heard of that? Yeah, that's where you put together a, a profile mm -hmm. of the company and that format is shared across many different angel syndicates as an application. Um, there are, are groups like Mass Challenge. I'm a, a judge um, and a speaker at Mass Challenge and a coach where we award uh, 50 to $100,000 prizes. And, um, you know, we'll screen, I, I think last this last year, I think we screened about 400 companies um, you know, and presentations and a lot of people like myself vote, uh, you know, obviously they don't see all 400 companies, but uh, they vote and then they, um, they, they can win uh, grants and stuff like that. Um, in the U.S., there's a lot of incubators and accelerators. Um, you know, the quality of the coaching there, I can't attest to, but no. they have a process and they, they give you some of the setups and, you know, usually coaches have uh, office hours when you can get little slices uh, of time and, and they might take a little percentage of your company or they might uh, charge a fee. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, with COVID fading, you know, some of those things are, are becoming uh, more active again. Um, so anyone else that has a question, um, you can uh, put your hand up or drop your question into the chat box. I'm going to look in the chat box now and um, see if anyone has put questions there. I'm not seeing anything. Who else would, uh, would like to ask a question about uh, raising capital today? No? Okay. Well, I, I know we're out of time. We're eight minutes beyond the projected 90 minutes, we will send out a recording and um, hope everyone can access the Dropbox fine. I know one person said they were having a problem, but we'll, we'll send, check on that and send out a link. It might just be their, their, their setup or their browser. But as I said, there's uh, 15 different supporting files with some articles and some statistics and some reports. Um, you know, I, I don't want to spend my time, um, you know, talking about things that you can easily read like quantitative data. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm providing uh, all of those resources. And we'll probably put some other resources in there uh, as we go. Um, we will be holding another uh, webinar in a month on April 12th. 
And uh, that one is about scaling companies. Our, our airtight management brand is the six systems that every company needs to prepare to scale. Um, so that's for more mature companies that probably already have um, you know, seven to 15 employees and are beginning to uh, systematize. But obviously you're all on our list. So you'll all get an invitation uh, to that if, uh, if you're interested in that. And I thank you all for attending. We'll, we'll send some follow-up emails and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to watch the recording again if you like, as well as access the, uh, the Dropbox of resources that we've set up. Thank you so much. Have a okay. nice day. Bye-bye, everyone. I'm going to end the session now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.